And we're live here at the 2014 Colorado State Conference in Westminster, California. 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 There is a Westminster, California. I'm sorry for my Colorado fans. Woo, that's a good way to get lynched right in the parking lot. I'm uh, Monica Million. I know you're familiar with me. Gina in Lakewood, thank you for joining us on the webcast. Um, today's ENP study group, we're going to focus on development of policy and procedure and the scheduling of employee time. Have you guys been reading your study guides? Yes. Yes? yes. No? Good answer. Good answer. Uh, I did not bring my pointer. You ready to go for it? I'm ready. Thank you, dear. How many of you have policies in your center? Weld County, DIA does, uh, Gina, I, I know Lakewood does. You know, people get really hung up on the differences between policy and procedure. I have to try to stay in the picture. Sorry, Daryl, I'm a wonder. You're good. Uh, policy is a guide to thinking. Uh, when we talk about what, it, what is a procedure? Uh, procedure is the instructions on how to do it, right? The policies are the framework with which in you build your processes. That's the, that's the best way I think about it. I know I have some really fancy language here. Policy should stay what happens in terms of outcomes in very general terminology. Stand by one. We have grim ones. But again, policy is the framework within you, within you define the rules of how you do. Oh my God, I've been talking way too much. Policy is the framework with which in you build your processes. That's what I'm trying to say. Please forgive me. Next. I apologize. I think uh, the internet connection here is a little slow. Okay. Policies can be developed in anticipation of need or in response to a need. What do you guys think I mean by that? Somebody makes a mistake and it's not covered in your current policy. So uh, for Gina's benefit, somebody, an employee might make a mistake and it's not necessarily covered in policy. So you have an opportunity to create some guidelines or some guidance, some framework with which in the employee could then um, expect to be guided through the next time they handle that particular set of circumstances. When we talk about anticipation, how about dealing with the next layer of technology or the next layer of change that we know is coming? For us in our agency specifically, text to 911. I know Weld County, you guys are getting ready to go to it. How about you guys? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. We're working on it. Yeah. I, and Gina, I'm not familiar in my last conversation with Jody about Lakewood's uh, ability to trans uh, to uh, implement text and I one, but you know, as much as you can get ahead of things that are happening to your employees, if you can at least craft the framework that will help to guide them when you define your processes, your implementation goes that much more smoothly, right? You can get enough information, there's enough tools, you've done enough networking to, to hey man, this, is, this agency's already on text and I don't know, what's your policy? And you can, don't remake, don't reinvent the wheel. Borrow it, plagiarize. We all offer our documents up, right? And uh, craft what fits your organization's needs. And I think we're having some more challenges. We are. Okay. Gina, we're losing the uh, internet connection. How big is your policy manual in Weld County? Um, it's being built. <clears throat> we have about 200 plus policies that either need to be touched or need to be written. I will caution you to create a war and peace policy novel. Like, don't make it 500 yeah. policies. Don't so define, don't paint yourselves in such a tight corner that you have no way to escape. Don't set yourself up to fail your own policies, I guess what I'm trying to say. If you have to so 
outline the framework with which in your employees are functioning, you're not probably managing your policies correctly. Well, but we also haven't touched the ones from our transition, so some of those will go away as good. we go through. Good, 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 good. And I'm sorry, thank you for clarifying that, oh, Tina. Okay. How about you, Jim? How many policies do you guys have? You know, we have more operating instructions than we do policies. That's probably right. And they're not very detailed. I mean, they cover the specifics. Mm -hmm. But just like you said, we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that happens with agencies is they make their policies so specific that you have nothing to do but fail the policy, right? Or not be successful in following your policy. Because you make the guidelines so strict that you can't, <laughs> you can never be successful in following them. I know you guys said you're recrafting your policies. Um, who participates in your policy development? We have a committee um, that kind of drives it. Who's on it? Um, supervisors and executive management at this point. Um, I think as we get farther into it, we'll include our line level staff to help us. Good. How about you guys? We have a, a committee that uh, is usually championed by a supervisor, but we utilize our frontline employees yeah. to give us feedback. I will um, tell you what we do at our center, and Gina, maybe on the webcast you can tell uh, Daryl uh, what you guys do in Lakewood. Um, our policy is crafted by our staff. We have oversight, but we let them develop it. I mean, obviously there are some things that we don't allow, but they have um, control over their destiny in that regard. And it helps them to understand what policy is supposed to do for them. So it's good. The next evolution of our policy development is to include our user agencies. Invite them to help craft our destination. Gina says they also include their staff. Good. Gina, thank you for that. Thanks. I'm sure you guys find it as value added as we do. Now, Weld County, your challenge is a lot more uh, difficult in that you're combining you're recrafting, you are redefining your organization. So I um, believe in what you're doing as far as just having supervision involved, because you really have to kind of narrow the focus. And sometimes that doesn't happen when you have too many players at the table, so. Next slide. And you can have this now. Oh, my clicker. Oh, your clicker. I'm sorry, I'm stepping out of the screen, Gina. <laughs> so we talked about procedure. I said policy is kind of the framework from within that you build your procedure. Procedure is the guide to action. Uh, let's see, a procedure that may be linked to the previous policy example might read, the telecommunicator will answer all 911 lines by the third ring and clearly state, 911, where is your emergency? So the last um, slide, I believe, said, next one back, the telecommunicator must be courteous to all callers. So just a general statement. And then the procedure is very specific on how the telecommunicator will answer the phone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Forward. You have to click here now. Oh, well, gosh. <laughs> I don't follow directions at all. And if, you guys should know that by now, by the way. Um, in this case, the procedure tell, tells the TC exactly what to do when the 911 lines ring. So procedure manual. A lot of agencies combine their policy and procedures together. Um, our policing agency that owns, that we fall under the leadership of, they actually have changed it instead of policy procedure manual, they call it directives. That is all encompassing, that has policy and processes or procedures outlined in that. So there's different things that you can label it. How important is policy and procedure? How much do you think, uh, how liable is your agency if you don't have policy and procedure in place? Somebody, very, yeah. For both the agency and the employee, right? Standardized level of service because we've provided them a framework from within how to do their job. So now we're standardizing the level of care and service that we're providing to the citizens by giving them that framework with it, with it into function. And do you guys review your policies annually? We do four. Wow. It changes a lot. Do you change Especially a lot? Especially operating instructions at the airport. 
Things change. Sometimes. Yeah, you're right. FAA yeah. and airlines, they're crazy. Um, <laughs> we're lucky to do annual. We're, our cycle is more like 18 to 24 months, mostly because of time constraint and our inability to get everybody together. Gina, I'd be interested to hear how often uh, you review your guys' policy. Does anybody think you need to do it more than that? Gina says we review them annually. Yeah, good, 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 good. I think yeah. people struggle with the keeping up on it. Um, I know years ago, Robert and I wrote pretty much the first version of our policies and procedures for our center because we operated under police guidelines for a long time. Right. And then we actually wrote something that was specific to our center. And it was difficult to maintain. It, it took almost a year just to produce that. Right. And then by the time we produced it and presented it, within the next year, so much had changed. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to keep up with the amount of change that goes on within a center within and you guys areas. serve 45 yeah. agencies Close. 40 42 42 43 so Jim's example is dealing with a federal agency that has nothing but change and then obviously the airlines and their impact to his policies when you're in a regional center and you serve so many different entities you become the victim of their changes and that's why I encourage centers like ours to involve the users in some of your policy development to help them understand what how they are crafting your world how they're impacting your world and to get them to understand that you need stability and consistency amongst your users so that the dispatchers job isn't so challenging Oh, I have to remember it's this PD and do it for this guy this way and this agency this way and this guy this way. It's really important that we help educate our users and how much they influence our policy and procedures by their demands. And by including them in the process, you help educate them with that. Good. Good, good, good. We talked about who should be involved and why, right? So we've talked about everybody from line level folks, uh, user agencies. Are there other people that you think would be of some benefit to include? Possibly anybody who could be affected by it. Right. Possibly anybody that could be affected by it. Um, you guys have QA people, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. QA people are mm -hmm. great. That part of an organization. Trainers are, if you have a training function within your center, those people are vital because you start figuring out what policies are the most difficult for people to process? What don't they understand? What is the hardest to translate into making them get it right, the employee to get it right? If the policies are that hard, there's probably something wrong with the policy. It's not the people, it's, the, it's what we're, how, they're, how we're instructing them to do the job. So uh, the training person in your organization, the QA person in your organization, I would also encourage you, maybe not all the time, because we already have enough of that injection, but every once in a while, I invite your executives to sit in or review your policy. They don't have to maybe necessarily attend your meeting. Here, here's my policies on X, Y, Z. I'd like your input. Tell me what you think. Is this the direction you're wanting us to go? Is this how you're wanting us to serve our users and get their input? So just some more opportunities. Anybody else that you guys can think of? Well, you just named off who's in our committee. Yeah, that's To be honest group. with you, that's our group, our training board. Yeah. <laughs> we're, in, we're in a fortunate place right now where we have the ability to not only rewrite the policy procedure manual, but also the training manual. Oh, and excellent. So it's kind of going hand in hand because there's not a black and white separation between the two. And, and you know what? That's actually really good. That's really good. Because that's exactly what you should be trained to anyway. How about you, Gina? Do you have anybody else that you can think of that should be involved? Maybe somebody that we haven't mentioned that you guys include? Some oversight. I'm just trying to make sure the people out in the web world are participating. No, nobody to add. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Gina. Anything else on policy? I think that's our last slide on policy and procedure. Do you have any general guidelines on how to write them? I mean, some, some, for some procedures are like you have an action, you say what they're going to do. 
Jeff, back to um, you, your procedure should be the guide to action. So if you are defining how they complete a task, your procedure should outline every step in that task. Every step. Especially if you're going to hold them accountable and it's going to be a tool from which you can use in liability situations. And I think with what Michael's saying too, that's the difficult part with between the you know the policies and our training. It's the training is the how to. These this is the task. This is how you should do it, okay. not the how to do it. Yeah, don't Thank put, you. That was don't don't put the how to in the policy and don't because then it, it becomes too specific and when you exactly you yourself down with all that. And remember too, so, so actually your exercise is a good one, especially from where you're at, because it'll very, it'll, it should be, the result should be a very complete circle of your information for your agency. But how many of the tasks that you do, is there five different ways for them to do the task? So in so much as you can, your procedure should be enter the address in the address field in CAD. Your training manual should say, you can accomplish that by doing it this way, this way, and this way. But you don't want to put all those five different ways in your procedure manual. Does that make sense? And then your policy would say, uh, the employee must collect the address, name, phone number, whatever the specific information that you guys require of your staff when they're processing a call for service. That's what your policy should outline. And then your procedure will say, enter it here. Your training manual will say, you can do it this way, this way. You can cross the finish line these ways. And then depending on their learning styles and their learning and their um, preferences, however they can process faster, that's the way you want them to do it, right? Does that make sense? Does that help? You're just going from general down to specific. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And but, being the most specific. Yeah, your training manual should be the most specific. And I just always caution you when you're developing policy and procedure, don't, you know, ask yourself the question after you recraft the policy. Am I painting? Is this something that we can be successful at every day? If you can't answer that question, then your policy is wrong. Don't. Don't paint your folks into a corner. That's often what we do. We create we create policy that nobody can live to. So then we're in, we're always put in a position to I'm writing Monica because she couldn't even follow policy, or we make the policy uh, of no value because we all break it every day because it's not possible to complete the task without violating the policy. So that invalidates the policy. I know I'm kind of talking in circles, but are, am I resonating with you guys? Okay. And, and one way to think about the difference between policy and procedure is that um, like EMD is procedure. Yes. Right? That's, you have step-by-step -step instructions that are in front of you, and you're using them while you're working. The policy manual needs to be basic enough and general enough that you can remember it without looking it up, because you're not going to sit there with your policy manual open going through and going, okay, now how do I take this call? Now how do I take this call? This is, it's more of a, a general um, general guidance rather than specific actions. Any medical call, you will, you will go through the MD process, period. There you go. Yeah, that's a great policy statement. Is that a good explanation? Okay. Any more questions on policy procedure before we move to our favorite topic, <laughs> scheduling? I feel like this is a uh, this is a huge undertaking. Um, I often think that a um, calculus equation should go along with scheduling staff. This is Michael's uh, mm -hmm. cup of tea. Uh, are you the mathematical genius in your? Yes. Yes. It. I have to tell you, I did scheduling once uh, <laughs> several years ago in my center when we only had 15 people, and it. I almost lost all my hair, so kudos to you. He doesn't have hair anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's why? Okay, I'm just saying. Uh, scheduling employee time. Look, the biggest part of our budgets are our labor costs, right? We can craft schedules 
that cost us an inordinate amount of overtime because we're not scheduling our people appropriately. We're not scheduling our people to be there during the time of day and day of week that we really need them. So we build schedules that mandate overtime, that require people to be there when we don't need that many people there. This is a, this is a fine art scheduling. It is a, it is a Rubik's Cube to me. We provide service on demand. So again, I, I mentioned just a, a few minutes ago, we schedule people to be there when our volume of work necessitates the number of people in the, the butts in the seat scenario, right? I don't know about you guys, but we do this whole analysis with our incoming phone data by time of day, day of week. We, we have this, you know, Excel spreadsheet phenomenon. And then we have another layer of radio transmissions by work console, push to talk times, layered over the top of that. Then by each console, how many incidents are created by the hour, by day of week, to determine where our workload is really at, to at the end of the day define when are my service demands the highest so I know how many people to plan. Who's on on all 410 schedule? I think Lakewood is. Gina, am I right? Jim, what are you guys on? We're mixed. We're 410 and 5 8 just because of staffing levels. Yeah, so are the capacity. We want to be 410s. Okay. Yeah. And you guys understand that a 410 schedule takes more people, mm -hmm. right? A, a 312 takes even more people. Um, are you guys on 12s? Or? Yeah. 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 Are you going to give me a psychoanalysis of, okay. Gina, Gina says yes, they are on 410s, and to your statement that it takes more people, she said yes with an exclamation mark. Yeah, uh, I'll share with you, a few years back, we tried to just dramatically convert to an all 410. We were trying to uh, enhance employee morale, uh, afford them more days off, but what ended up happening was we created so much overtime that they didn't, they barely got one of their three days a week off. So we actually created a, a bigger problem than we did by we were on a hybrid uh, four, eight, four, 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 eight, five, ten schedule. Five, eight, four, ten schedule. Oh my God. Uh, and they've been happy with it because we have people on our staff that are okay with working five eights. So don't be afraid to look at that. Your staffing should balance with your service delivery needs. One of the biggest questions that I got asked, we all have budget challenges, and we've been facing budget challenges. I was recently in our um, board workshops. We did an education uh, session with our um, purse string holders, if you will, so the city and town managers that uh, shape our destiny in educating them on how we staff our center because they're, fo they're foot in the bill. And I got very direct questions on, do I have people unnecessarily there? Um, am I going to show up uh, next June with a, with a budget request that I need another $100,000 because we overran our overtime budget? And so I got very direct questions on what our staffing looks like. And your manager, your executive director has to be able to answer these questions, especially in our current times, that we're really planning people to be here when our service demands necessitate, necessitate that. And like I said earlier, it's a fine art. <sighs> Poorly designed schedules contribute to fatigue and boredom. How many times have you worked in your career in whatever center you were at, and you knew for the first four hours you really didn't, they didn't need the five people that were sitting there, right? I, at some time in our careers, we can all admit to, we were sitting at a time that when we weren't, weren't needed. And we get upset because we've already worked a considerable amount of overtime, and you're like, I got time, I need to be off, let me go. So you, you can really contribute to your employees' fatigue and lower productivity. Long assignments on the same shift. How many of you guys rotate? How oh, rotate? No. Not at First all? rotation, no. No. Do, do they voluntarily rotate? We're, we're, we're thinking about doing that just because we're finding that 
folks who are consistently on the midnight shift, especially at the airport, because uh -huh. there's less activity. Right. They're losing a lot of their skills, and they're having difficulties when they're covering a the day or swing shift. Yeah. So we're kind of weighing and looking at the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. From a management perspective, we like the idea of rotating. Right. But we also want to consider, you know, they have a life. If they don't want to rotate. I'll share with you, our center went from mandated shift rotation. So we had a schedule that mandated you worked a day's swings combination through the four quarters of the year or a day's graves combination through the four quarters of the year. To what we have now is you can bid whatever schedule you want no matter the quarter. We have people who have been on graveyards for two years. What I'm trying to do with those folks is remind them that it is not normal for the human body to be awake during nighttime hours. And in having those kinds of wellness conversations, we've convinced them to voluntarily bid a day shift one quarter of their four quarters of the year. That way their skills, because there is a very direct correlation with allowing people to stay on particular shifts, because we all know we get different calls for service on different times of the day, right? I'm sorry? So how do you work your bid if you're gonna give people, because the way we do ours is pure seniority. So I've been on nights for four years, and there is no option for me to go to days for probably another five to 10 years if that doesn't change. So how do you do your bid to allow those people the opportunity to go to days? Uh, we have a tiered bid. For every five years of service, they get to bid another quarter. So I have a 30-year veteran who, by right, 30 years of service, she gets to pick all four of her quarters first before everybody. Unfortunately for her peers, she is a swing shift fan, so she works swings. Um, we were able to break that paradigm only by allowing you to bid one quarter at a time. So the senior folks could not come in and bid all four quarters because you will never break out of that cycle unless you change that. And so what happens in that example is you get people who, I'm like, I'm not gonna stay in this job. I'm gonna be on nights for the next 10 years because there's 10 people above me and they're not going anywhere. So there's a different employee satisfaction factor there and something that you guys might wanna consider. But there are ways to do it, and the way we broke that was by you bid one quarter at a time, still in seniority order, and then we, we added a caveat about three years ago. Every five years of service means you get to bid another quarter. So in my example, our 30-year veteran, so if you got 20 years, you get to bid all four quarters, right? So she gets to bid all four. I have two people in my 15-year category, so... My employee A, 30-year vet, she bids first. Her shifts are gone. The two 15-year people come in in their seniority order, right, one at a time. They go back and they bid three quarters. Then it goes to my 10-year vets, two quarters, and the five-year folks, and then the rookies. And then we go back to the 15-year folks so they can pick their last quarter. So we kind of do, does that make sense? Kind of like a round robin kind of style? But that's the only way we broke that. And do you bid a year at a time? Yes, we do. It can get and complicated fast, huh? It does, it's very complicated, but we, I'll tell you what, the payoff for employee morale was is well worth the schedule management work we have to do to do that. And I'll tell you, we just completed our bid. We start our bid the first week of October for the upcoming year. Our bid was done in three days for 47 people. And they're allowed four hours to make their choice. We give them their bid packet a week in advance so they can go home, study it with their spouses or their roommates or whatever, their family members, to help determine what shifts they're going for, days off they're going for. And by the time it comes up, they're ready to go. It's like the horse races. It's very fun. We all like have fantasy bid. It's crazy. Do you guys have it too? Yeah, it's crazy. I will tell you, too, our supervisors bid the same way. I have two 20-year supervisors, Glenn and Tom, and they get to pick their quarters, as they should. They're 20-year vets. There is, it's really the only thing that we have to give them is shift preference. 
because we don't get paid more, right? We're government employees. We're all paid the same, right? And uh, my last position, I was a PSAP manager in New Mexico, and we did something pretty similar to that. We had our shifts broken up, and instead of quarters, they were every four months, so it was three shifts, shift kids a year. Right. And the it went purely by seniority, except that I instituted a policy that they could not bid on the same shift more than twice in a row. And that was done for a couple of reasons. One, because your your skills get stale if you stay on the same shift. And we also had problems with um, clickishness and infighting within or you know, groups forming within a shift with the same people working to day in and day out. By forcing them to break up a little bit, they got to work with different people and, and create, create a little bit more um, agency cohesion. Yeah, and, and fortunately for us, we've been bidding like this now for four years. When we have started to see clicks develop, and you know, you have the one person coming to you always, I can't work with Monica anymore, she's driving me completely up the wall. Well, bid a different shift. Y you are in control of that. So we've been able to let them manage that instead of forcing it upon them. So there's, there's tactics that you can use to do that. But and, uh, and if you don't want to do the horse race, another way to do it is to have everybody turn in a list from their most preferred shift to their least preferred shift and then you go by seniority down that stack. And so if they can't, if the, their first pick is already taken, then you go to the second one, you go to the third one. That way you don't have to, okay, I've got two hours to decide and then just pass on to the next person. I'll tell you, our people seem to get a lot of satisfaction in having, whether it's a um, illusion or not, of selecting their own schedule. They get to pick their destiny and, and putting that power in their hands gives them a level, level of satisfaction that helps with their morale. That, that's the only thing mm -hmm. I'll say about that. Absolutely. Can I just say one thing, Natina? One of our PSEPs does senior down to rookie, and then rookie gets to start the oh. second round. So How do your seniors that? feel about that? I don't know. Since wow. I'm not in the PSAP anymore, I don't know how that... That so Gina, I don't know if you can hear, but that's a different dynamic. She said that their shift, their bid goes first from senior to rookie, and then the second round from rookie to senior. That's, whoo, that's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. I don't know how you could put in, like, your yeah. 20, 30, your seniors in there. Because I agree, they, they kind of deserve that. But yeah. I kind of like that, too, because it gives the new guy a chance to at least have one shift. Right. And in our, so I appreciate that Daryl talked about the three uh, quarter uh, solution. Ours is a four quarter solution. You know, that's the other thing um, I noticed across the country that comm centers do differently, their shift change times. Uh, our agency, when I hired in there in 2001, we used to shift change every six weeks. I mean, you couldn't even get your sleep pattern right before you were on another shift. And that was when we were on forced rotation. So you were doing days grave, day swings, and you're like, I don't even know what time of day it is on this eighth week. You're like, am I up? Am I down? Am I sleeping? What time of day is it? I can't even keep up. So be really careful um, if you're somebody or if you're an agency that chooses to rotate at certain times of the year. Make sure you find some balance. For us, the four-quarter scenario has worked. Our patrol division actually does the three-quarter scenario. The SO uh, agency that we support actually shifts only once every six months. Everybody's got different ways that they do it, so just think of all those things, keep them in your mind. Um, another thing that people often lose sight of is how quickly we ask them to come back on duty. Um, make sure you're when you're building your um, schedule that as shift changes, you have adequate sleep time built in between. Um, Again, we talked about this earlier, long periods of consecutive work days, short off-duty periods, few weekends off. You know, one of the things that we did at our center, there is not one staff schedule, not even a supervisor schedule, that gives anybody Saturday and Sunday off. Somebody either has to work Saturday or they work Sunday, but everybody works one day of the weekend. Because there's really not an easy, there's not a fair way to do that. Their work week is Sunday through Wednesday or Wednesday through Saturday. 
Now we're heavy on Wednesday, but what we've done with that is we've made Wednesday our committee meetings. You know, our our policy review committee they can they can get together without generating more overtime for us. Our CTOs can get together and problem solve or work on new training plans. Uh, the supervisors that's when we meet at night is on Wednesday evenings because that's when all of our staff is here. So it's even though it creates a huge overlap. You can use that to your advantage without generating more overtime from your staff. One thing to consider too, when you're talking about how often to to rotate, is um, you know the the life schedules of the, of your employees at home. Right. The reason why we went to three a year was so that we could match it at least somewhat with the school year. Yes. Because some people wanted to work during the day during the school year and work nights during the summer when the kids were home during the day. Yeah, and the bigger challenge now is that we, we seem to be migrating towards a year-round plan in Mesa County. I don't mm -hmm. know about you guys, but our school district just keeps shaving weeks off at the front end, and they started school the first week of August. Mm -hmm. and now they have a, they're, right now this week they're on fall break. That's a new ad. They have a two-week spring break. They have a two-week winter break. I can't even keep up with it. I don't have kids, so. <laughs> to try to figure it out. I don't know how parents do, do it anymore. But you do have to keep your staff's lifestyles and, the, and their lives, and you have to take that into consideration when you're building your schedule. So thank you, Daryl. That was something good to talk about. Unequal distribution of desirable schedule properties. Again, I think for us, I talked specifically about the weekends. You know, everybody wants them off, but we're a shift working organization. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when we are contemplating an applicant uh, we hand them a bunch of information we sit down we go to their home if you can believe it I don't know if you guys do this uh, we allow their spouse or their family to ask us questions we take the schedule we take a shift bid we talk to them right up front this is shift work you're a brand new employee you're probably going to be on nights you're going to get unfavorable schedules you're never going to work you're never going to have weekends and you're not going to have holidays off for the first five years that's worst case scenario here's the schedule here's how it works it, right, is your spouse, is your roommate, is your family going to support you in this effort, or are you going to get a bunch of flack your whole career, making it more problematic for you, or you present an opportunity for them to weigh in on your new candidates or your new employees' um, job opportunities? So I'll just offer that up. The sooner you educate them on how challenging our schedule is, the more buy-in you'll get from them. Just a little FYI. Clicker. What's the right schedule? I, I don't know that there is one. You have to make, we all have different needs. We, we serve different needs. We serve different agencies. We serve different uh, social and economic um, sectors of the population. But is it not the number one? issue in your comm center is your schedule. And what works for one of us doesn't necessarily work for the other one. That's why I, when I first started going to conferences in 2004 as a new supervisor, that was the number one question I asked. Of people I met at conferences at training, how do you schedule? What's your schedule look like? How does your bid work? H how do you offer time off to your employees? Gather as much information as you can. I will share with you the most, the very most unique example I ever heard was Iceland. I was fortunate enough to be in a class with the manager of the Iceland comm center. There's one. His challenge is he has a limited population, a, t a limited tax base, so his funding, he was operating in the red every year. He finally got approval from his leadership uh, to offer services to the private sector so that they would, but the government would keep 51% control. So it was 49% privatized, 51% government entity. And he broke his employee's schedule into two hour increments. It was crazy. I had never ever heard of anything like this in talking to people. They bid it all online. There were two hours, I mean, it was all electronic, internet kind of based deal. And it worked for them. People would just sign up for this two hours and, and they would fill up their 40 hours or I think he had to have 38 hours, I don't remember exactly. But it was 
Conceptually, to me, it was absolute lunacy, but it worked fabulously for them. His people were totally happy, but they scheduled their whole life in two-hour increments, their whole work life. I was like, oh my God, how do you do that? But it was crazy. But that is probably the most extreme example I've ever run across in this country. But, but really, reach out and find out what people are doing, because some people are getting really creative, because it is the biggest issue in our workplace. What kind of variables do you think we should think about? We talked about some. Can you think about others? Efficiency. Efficiency. Um, how to maximize the amount of body and how many you can get in there on 24 hour positions. Right. Anybody else? Gina? She says yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gina. Brilliant. Um, one thing to try to keep in mind, if it's possible, avoid shift changes during the busiest time of your day. Yeah. Because it's really hard to get that one person up off the console when they're just getting their butt handed to them and have the next person sit down and, and just hit the ground running. It's really difficult. Well, inevitably, inevitably, what's happening is you've got your biggest incident happening right then, and you're trying to transition from one dispatcher to the next. And they're getting half the story, and they're coming. The anxiety level of both of them is up, you know, through the roof, because they're one's trying to pass off, the other one's trying to go, "What the heck's happening? I don't even know everything." And I got officers all over here, I got EMTs all over there, and I don't know what's going on. So that's a really important point. How do you handle briefings? Do, does your center do briefings? Yes, we do. Um, so we have. Here's the challenge for us because we have managed our schedule down so much we have nine different start stop times the unfortunate thing is that makes it very challenging to have structured briefings but what we do do is we do a briefing at 7 a.m a briefing at 1700 and a briefing at 2100 so we have three standard briefings every day uh, we have a 30 minute overlap that our employees get paid to the offgoing so at the top of the hour, at the top of those hours, the oncoming team sits down outside of the comm center with the supervisor and they go over the briefing items. And they generally take 10 to 15 minutes. Occasionally they go to 20 minutes. But most of the time the people in the room get relieved before the end of their half hour. So there's really no argument that we're keeping them past their shift time. But that briefing is really important. The unfortunate thing is because we have developed so many start and stop times that the others that are on those non-standard shifts often miss out. So what we've been trying to do is email the briefing items to everybody, encouraging them to have conversation when they sit down, have that supervisor maybe go sit when that shift kind of mellows out a little bit so you could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation at the console. But it makes it really challenging for the supervisor. So, good question. That's the way we manage it. I don't, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, that's just how we do it. There's a, there's a pesky little piece of uh, law called the Fair Labor Standards Act, too, that if you have people come in early for briefing or, or stay late to, to do a briefing, you know, you gotta be careful because uh, you can get yourself uh, sideways with that if you're not, <laughs> you, you have to pay, you have to pay them. Right, for the you work. have to pay them. That's part of the work day. That's so. part of the work day, and we just built it into our schedule, that 30 minutes. Yeah. Do you guys have often? You guys have briefings? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't. I uh, personally, I'm not. Do you guys have briefings? We do mm -hmm. at, at the position at the console. Yeah. But we want to do something similar to having it away from the workstation with our supervisor to be a half hour overlap. Yeah. Yeah. How are we doing on time? Three fifty-five. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I keep forgetting I'm in control of my own destiny here. <sighs> you know, as you're building a schedule, here's some, this, this is very definitely in your study guide. Here are some specific human resource considerations. You know, when you're building a schedule and if you're a union shop, you've got some really probably particular rules that guide how you can create your schedule. It's probably in their contract. So make sure if you ever are supervising, I know none of you are union shops. You're not a union shop, right? Um, but if you ever are, make sure you're well-versed in what those contract uh, 
specifics are. I know some comm centers who actually schedule and build the, they're not Monday through Friday people. I have actually run across some IT staff that work non-standard schedules. They have, a, it's a larger center, they have a, a more IT staff that they can spread across so there's always IT support. It was really interesting, it's crazy, I love it. I think it's a great concept and we need more IT folks, but remember that your scheduling can often include other non-PSAP employees. <laughs> um, another consideration, especially, we don't have too many of these left in Colorado, but um, look at this. Look at Monica's typo, sworn policy officers. <laughs> <laughs> we knew what you meant. You know what I meant. Uh, if your personnel are sworn, uh, firefighters or EMTs or non-civilian, uh, they may have um, regulations or rules that you need to follow to meet their needs, and different federal and state employee statutes apply to sworn and non-sworn employees. So make sure you're familiar with FSLA and whatever other rules that might be shaping your community. Questions? Comments? Gina, do you got anything? Question. Um, for your schedule on the 5-8s, mm -hmm. what do you do with your night people? Because for like most of the people that have little kids, like on our 12s we have four days off every other weekend and one of those days is basically our turnaround day where we sleep stupid to turn around and spend time with our family. On 5-8s you have two days off and that's not enough time to turn around. Uh, our graveyard is all uh, four tents. So the only five eights for us are days or swing shifts. What, what we consider power shift, our 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift, is tens. So our power and graveyard shifts are all 10 hour shifts so that they have three days off. Because exactly that reason. 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. 5 p.m. to 3.30 a.m. And then 2100 to 0730 is our graveyard shift. Yeah. We did, it was a scheduling nightmare, but we just to make as much variety for the for the employees as possible for for them to choose from when they were doing their shift bid, we did uh, eights, tens, and twelves. Wow. We had uh, we had several shifts that were three twelves, then they had to work like four hours on one of the other four days. Yeah. But they had almost four full days off a week. I, I've been fortunate in our agency that even our I am not a fan of twelve hour shifts. I'm just telling you that no. right now because it's never twelve, it's fourteen, mm -hmm. and it's never ten, it's twelve. And you can only be brain dead. For, I mean, you you can only function efficiently for a certain amount of time. So I, I really challenge, especially comp center, to stay away from 12-hour shifts. One of the complaints I got from one of our employees that's leaving is that we just recently split up our teams, so we have all these staggered start dates. And they are, he says that that has contributed to low morale, that there's no team atmosphere anymore. Yeah. They don't feel like a family. They feel like we've we've broken up everything and he really says that that was the day that he decided to start looking for employment elsewhere it was the day we broke up the teams so if you go to an eights tens type thing can you create scheduling where you're keeping people starting with the same people because right now and I'll be honest as a supervisor I don't know if people are coming or going if somebody didn't show up for work I don't know how I know because <laughs> so many people start on different days I see. I will tell you it is a significant challenge for us um, and recently because we've had to do it to such a degree to meet our budget uh, our exit interviews are indicating that we're having a that's one of the biggest complaints for us too if we could go but our standard start times didn't change so for the most part the majority of our people are coming in at 7 a.m. 1700 or 2100 mm -hmm. there's of our 30 of our 43 dispatchers six of them come in on start their work week on a different time of the day but you kept sunday through see we we have different start <clears throat> days not start times okay so we have no team yeah at all. okay so that's, yeah, that's the a problem complaint, is the start days are not cohesive we have people starting on Sundays. So starting and, on and even Sunday in our Friday. schedule, I will say the majority of our people, their start days are the same. But I'm I'm not painting the whole picture. I do have people who are Tuesday through Friday, but it's a half a dozen of the 43 people. So it's not the majority. So so there's still that cohesion from people all 
really still being together. Does that make sense? But with that, that was a double-edged sword on that one because of the fact that we were doing either front end or back end of the week. You either work front end or you work back end. Right. And the reason we did that is to break up some of those clicks. Yeah. But yeah. I think if we went through a different bidding process like they have, we could do that successfully and keep sides of the week. So also, with what Tina and I were talking about, what we've learned just in these last two days is as a supervisor, if we start building up these problem employees and complementing the good and focusing our energy on the great things they're doing and change the atmosphere, we shouldn't have to say we have problem teams anymore. As a supervisory staff, we should be able to find the good in these employees and mentor that and grow well, our employees in that way. I think one of the other um, good things about having a staggered schedule where they start on different days, different times, you could potentially be having a new person coming in every single hour, and it's totally fresh for that hour, you know, and able to help out other people who are dwindling down for that day. The, the beauty for, the, the way that it's been a benefit for us besides meeting my budget, <laughs> uh, is that it has created a lot more diversity in the day. Right. Um, that has added a considerable amount of value now, don't get me wrong, there was a time when I needed the clicks broke up, but what's happened now is that Monica comes in with Robert, who comes in with Raylene, who comes in with Troy. Troy's coming in now with Mark and Holly and, and Tina. I mean, we've really broken up, and now everybody has a flavor of working with everybody. So you really, there's a couple of things that are benefited by that. Your new person immerses into the team faster because I'm, I'm exposed to everybody. I never saw Monica because she worked graveyards for three years in a row and I never saw her because she was on that team and I don't even know who she is. I never got to bond with her. And so we've really been able to integrate our team more effectively by doing that. So you have to find the good. I'll share with you another thing that we did and I know this is kind of scary. We, a year ago, last year, I gave an employee work group, no supervisors. I said, you tell me how you want to work. Here's the parameters. Here's what FSLA, here's what our, here's the pay skate, here's the pay periods you have to stay on. Yeah, we have to stay in an 80 hour work week. I'm sorry, what? an 80 hour pay period. Work, not a work week, holy crap. Um, Cause they wanted to, they wanted to uh, venture into a potential 40 hour pay period, uh, but our, our HR wouldn't let us do that. But anyway, we put it to them. I gave them the same information, the workload by time of day, day of week. I said, you figure it out. You tell me what the schedule's gonna look like. They worked on it for four months, four months. And I'll tell you, they came up with a more complex schedule than we did. We made one person from every team be on the schedule committee. They picked who it was, but every team had to be represented. And you talk about putting the power in their hands and them getting it. It really made some of the people understand what a challenge it is to build a schedule for your center. I don't know if you're ready to do anything like that, but I, I would. there is a great deal of benefit to an exercise like that. It's scary, but at the end of the day, they created it, they bought into it. And another thought in favor of staggering schedules throughout the day is that continuity of knowledge. Um, if, you, if you break up the schedules in such a way that you've got people coming in, and leave, or leave, coming in and leaving like every couple hours or every four hours, then chances are there's still somebody on the shift that remembers what happened six hours ago. Yeah. So that, and that helps a lot in, on those busy days when you've got lots of things going on. Yeah, great point, Daryl. Great point. Good questions. Anything else? Helpful? Mm -hmm. Very. Thank Good. You. Thank you, guys. I don't know if you're going to be too late to go to one of the 4 o'clock sessions. I need some You can water. sneak in. I need water. I've been talking for four hours. Five minutes. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. Oh, you Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. Do you remember my Can I help you? Cash bar opens in 55 minutes. Oh, brilliant. Oh my god. Take my oh.
I have to MC, so I need some quiet time. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be happy, crazy, hand up for prizes yeah, and yes, no. no, I don't think so. I just gotta break all this down. What replaced? Oh, there's only two, right?